Hello, and welcome to Emerging Viewpoints. I'm Nick Stottmiller. Today we're joined by Khatija Haq to discuss the recovery in Dubai's tourism sector after the pandemic, the Emirates trade and logistics industry, inflation, and the outlook for construction and real estate. Khatija is Chief Economist and Head of Research at Emirates NBD in Dubai. Khatija, welcome. Hi, Nick. Thanks very much for having me on. So Dubai took a real hit in tourism uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, tourism numbers in 2020 were down by about two thirds over 2019. You had a mild recovery in 2021. And then the Expo 2020 Expo, uh, Expo was uh, delayed by a year. So you had that over the fall and the tourism numbers from Q1 look pretty good. I saw 4 million visitors in Q1 with 80% occupancy in hotels, which looks pretty strong. But now that you have a, a recovery in place after the pandemic and the expo is done, uh, what's the next act for Dubai's tourism sector? Yes, I mean, we have had, um, I think, a marked recovery since the start of expo. Um, but that also chimed with a relaxation in travel restrictions, not just here, but in many other countries as well. Um, and that, I think, has helped to boost the recovery in tourism in Dubai. Um, so we, we have actually um, more recent data as well. So we've got data through to the end of May now, and that shows the total number of visitors um, through Dubai at 6.2 million people, which is around 15% below where it was over the same period in 2019. So not quite back to pre-pandemic levels, but getting there um, reasonably quickly. Um, we've, as you say, um, seen hotel occupancy uh, rebound largely to pre-pandemic levels. And in fact, that's even with the big increase in the number of hotel rooms in the Emirates, which um, was obviously necessary to host the expo. So we've had an increase in the supply of rooms, but the recovery has been sufficient to bring hotel occupancy back to where it was before the pandemic. And of course, revenue per available room um, has actually gone above where it was in 2019 it's around 20% higher. So that really shows that there is demand for uh, tourism services in Dubai and has been certainly through uh, the first five months of this year. Um, besides Expo, I think Dubai has to be credited uh, more broadly the UAE with the management of the pandemic. And I think that did a lot to try and reassure people about the safety of coming to Dubai um, on holiday we have obviously very high vaccination rates, um, which has been a, a big help in containing the pandemic. And the healthcare infrastructure is of a very high standard. So even if people came to Dubai on holiday and found themselves uh, unwell, they were able to access very high quality care. And I think that went quite a long way to making people feel comfortable and confident about uh, coming here on holiday. Now, going forward, um, we do have the FIFA World Cup in Doha in the fourth quarter of this year. So I think that will um, contribute to a sustained recovery, uh, at least on the demand side. Um, and of course, even though we've seen a sharp rebound in terms of Dubai tourism, overall, when you look at air passenger traffic, um, the figures from IATA suggest that we're still quite a long way below where we were before the pandemic struck. Big markets like China, of course, are still closed. So I think there is an expectation that over the next um, two years, we will continue to see a gradual recovery in um, air passenger traffic more broadly. And given the reopening of uh, the long haul markets from Asia through to um, Europe and North America, I think Dubai is quite well positioned to benefit from that traffic um, as it resumes. Um, so I think overall, it's a fairly constructive story, but there are certainly some downside risks. And I think the biggest one for us going forward, given the acceleration in um, Fed rate hikes, is the strong dollar. So if we think back to where we were in 2018, when, again, we were in a period of dollar strength, um, that certainly was a difficult environment for the tourism sector here in Dubai, because, of course, we are pegged to the dollar which means that things become a lot more expensive for visitors from emerging markets where currencies tend to be quite a lot weaker when, when US rates are high. And around 50% or more of Dubai's international visitors come from emerging markets. And so clearly I think there is gonna be an issue of um, an erosion in competitiveness uh, and Dubai is simply becoming a more expensive destination for people 
from Asia, from other emerging markets, and even within the MENA region, although um, other GCC countries are also pegged to the dollar largely, um, if you've got a very weak euro, it becomes a lot more attractive potentially and a lot cheaper to go to Europe than uh, to come to Dubai. Asian destinations start to look a lot more attractive as well. So I do think there will be some headwinds potentially in the second half of the year um, from those um, those price pressures or um, currency pressures rather. You mentioned uh, the build out of capacity in hotels in Dubai. And I, I went back and looked up the figures to refresh my memory. In 2009, there were about 40,000 hotel rooms. And uh, of course we were just reeling from the global financial crisis. And uh, so at the time, I recall, uh, I just moved there and they were talking about building that out to 100,000 hotel rooms. And now after you add the hotel and hotel apartment rooms, we're at about 140,000. And I, I think this is kind of the history of Dubai as you grow at breakneck speed when conditions are good and then there's some sort of setback and then you kind of plow forward and it's worked quite well for them. But I mean, there has to be some upper limit to how large the hotel industry at the tourism industry broadly can go. So do you think we're close to that limit or is there room for a significant growth from here? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, as you say, Dubai has invested a huge amount in infrastructure, not just um, hotels, but the surrounding tourism infrastructure as well. So theme parks, um, leisure attractions, um, you know, things for visitors to do, and also the transport networks around it. So the airport's been expanded a couple of times. We've now got a second big airport. Um, as well, there's much bigger conferencing facilities which have been added along with the expo infrastructure. So all of that, I think, um, is is setting Dubai up for a period of sustained growth. Um, and I think that you know, given you know the ease with which people can uh, come to Dubai, um, I think there is still scope for for growth. Um, and to the extent that the demand materializes, I think um, you know Dubai could still potentially you know, even uh, add more supply in terms of uh, hotel rooms, perhaps not all at the very top end of the market. I think there is quite a lot of demand now for sort of mid-priced um, hotels rather than the super luxury ones. Um, so I think, you know, there is scope um, and niches where they could still see quite strong growth. So we talked about uh, the decline in tourism during the pandemic, and one of the other lasting scars that we saw as a result of the pandemic is uh, higher shipping costs, supply chain bottlenecks, and other problems. And uh, transport and uh, trade make up over a third of Dubai's economy. So how has Dubai uh, dealt with uh, problems in the supply chain in the wake of the pandemic, and how are they overcoming those problems? We haven't seen, I think, the supply chain disruptions to the same extent as you have in North America or, or even perhaps in Europe and the UK. Um, so I think one of the reasons for that is we didn't get the same kind of um, fiscal support measures during the pandemic. There was nothing in the way of um, stimulus checks to households or enhanced unemployment benefits. So we didn't get that big boost to demand. Um, and so perhaps there wasn't that much of an imbalance between the demand and the supply that was available. Um, if we look at the GDP data that we've just seen for Dubai uh, for Q1, we've still had a very strong growth in the transport and logistics sector, um, even in the first quarter of this year, it was up around 40% year on year. Um, and it was a similar rate of growth in Q4 of 2021. So the rebound appears to have maintained momentum um, and I suspect that it will determine, it'll be determined to a large extent by what happens with global trade volumes going forward. So if we're into a situation where um, a faster acceleration or a, a faster rate of um, increase in, increase in interest rates leads to slower US consumption growth, and that leads then to a slowdown in the volume of global merchandise trade, then clearly I think, um, you know, overall the logistics sector will be affected by those lower volumes. But at the moment, that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, the data that we've seen uh, on global merchandise trade, value, uh, trade volumes appears to have uh, stabilized, but it's not really falling. Um, so I think, you know, we'll have to wait and see how consumers respond to uh, higher interest rates, whether they, they stop buying more stuff. Um, and whether that leads to ultimately a decline in, in global trade volumes, because that will really be the driver 
for the transport and logistics sector um, in our region. But the other factor is that even if global trade volumes uh, moderate, we will have, I think, quite a lot of investment within the GCC. And a lot of the materials and the equipment for that investment may come through the UAE's ports. Um, and so I think any uh, growth in terms of uh, what's been driven by government investment within the region will continue to support the transport and logistics sector. And then, of course, a lot of that uh, sector activity comes from uh, air passenger traffic um, through through Dubai and uh, other major airlines in the region. So I think um, to the extent that we, again, see that sustained recovery in international tourism, um, that would also help, I think, to keep that sector um, going reasonably well. And, uh, and another effect, after effect of the pandemic is, of course, inflation, uh, which we've seen higher inflation uh, across the world. In Dubai, uh, it sits uh, at the UAE, it's 4.6%, uh, I believe, right now, uh, which is its highest level since 2015, but quite a bit lower than what you've seen in, in most developed and emerging markets elsewhere in the world. But inflation has always uh, fascinated me in Dubai specifically because you have this huge difference between uh, the expatriates and the locals in terms of their consumption basket. So the inflation figures give you an average for the economy, but they don't really tell you much about individual uh, groups within Dubai and what they actually experience. So what can you tell us about uh, what's going on in inflation and how that's uh, affecting different populations within Dubai? Yeah, it is a very um, unique, um, as you say, index, consumer price index. And it is quite difficult. Nobody seems to really look at it and say, this inflation rate reflects my own experience. Everybody's got something to say about why the inflation number isn't representative of, of what the actual cost of living is. Um, I think, you know, when we look at the data that we've seen for the first five months of the year, as you say, Dubai CPI running at around 4.7%, the biggest driver has been transport costs. And that's up by around 27%, I think, in May on an annual basis. Um, and again, um, a huge driver of that has been the increase in petrol prices. Now, the UAE is the, the only country in the GCC that has actually passed on higher global oil prices to consumers at the pump. All the other GCC countries have really kept their um, fuel prices unchanged um, since last summer. Um, and so I think this is the first time that consumers have had to pay these prices for petrol. And it's also the first time that businesses have had to pay uh, these prices for, for fuel. And of course, um, Dubai, the UAE, very reliant on uh, delivery services, on, as you say, uh, logistics, moving things around, both uh, from one country to another, but also within, within the UAE. So I think going forward, it'll be interesting to see how businesses adapt. We've already started to see some firms uh, no longer providing free delivery services, for example. Um, people are starting to try and reduce the amount of um, time that they spend driving and, and rely a little bit more on public transport um, or to you know, uh, effectively cut down the amount that they commute. Um, so I think that that is gonna be going forward a big driver of inflation as well uh, across all demographics. Um, and then the other big driver so far has been food prices and that's up around eight and a half percent year on year. Now, again, this is a global phenomenon um, but we certainly are not immune to it uh, in the UAE, even given the various measures that the government has taken to try and minimize uh, price gouging and to try and make sure that only um, you know, items that really have increased in price for wholesalers, um, that those price increases are being passed through and in a managed way. Um, so we haven't seen the kind of spikes in food prices, I think, that some of the other uh, markets have uh, have seen in recent months. Um, on the rent on the rental side, it is a rather unusual situation because we know from looking at market rates that both the cost of buying a home and the cost of renting a home have increased dramatically over the last year. So, looking at free zone um, villas in Dubai, they're up by around thirty percent year on year on a price on a purchasing basis basis. Rents are up a little bit less, but still quite a lot more than what's reflected in the consumer price index. So when we look at the CPI, housing costs are actually still down on a year-on-year -year basis. Now, part of it is that 
um, it takes a long time for changes in market rates to feed through to the, the index because not everybody is renewing a lease at the same time and not everybody's rents are going up by the same amount. So the biggest changes in the cost of housing that we've seen have been in freehold areas of Dubai and in particular the larger villas and the larger apartments. And that tends to be Western expatriates that really um, uh, are using those um, housing uh, services. You know, there is a, a huge number of um, housing stock that's available outside of free zone areas which haven't seen the same rate of increase um, in prices or in rents. And of course, if you're renting a studio or a one bedroom apartment um, in a non free zone area, the chances are your, your housing costs have not increased as much as someone who is renting um, a five bedroom villa on the Palm, for example. Um, so I think it is very difficult for, um, you know, a, a CPI that's covering the entire Emirate and all population groups to, to accurately reflect what, what people are paying because people are actually paying very different amounts for, um, for housing stock in particular. Um, and the inflation um, is quite different in different segments of the market. So I think going forward, that is going to be problematic. But I do expect that housing within the CPI will turn positive in the coming months um, and will then add to headline inflation pressures um, in the second half of this year. You mentioned earlier that uh, the, the cost of fuel is uh, is raising costs for businesses uh, and that you're seeing some uh, some changes to, to the level of service that those businesses offer. Uh, do, you, do you think that demand is strong enough uh, for businesses to pass on higher uh, producer prices under the consumer prices then? Um, I think it depends on the segments in the market. So um, if you're running, you know, fairly low, low margin, um, you know, high turnover type of business, you may not be able to pass on, um, you know, grocery de delivery, for example, um, you know, they probably won't be able to uh, pass on um, the, the, the increases in, in prices. Um, but if you are, are running, a, you know, a business where you have your margins are, are a little bit higher, um, and the demand is, you know, from a certain segment of the market that maybe is willing to pay a little bit more than I think you might be able to uh, pass on some of those higher costs. But I think on aggregate, when we look at the survey data, businesses in the UAE don't feel confident in their pricing power. So um, they don't seem to be able to pass on um, higher input costs in the same way that businesses in Saudi Arabia have been doing. And we see that data in the PMI survey, where in Saudi Arabia, as input costs have gone up, selling prices have gone up as well. In the UAE, there seems to be much more evidence of input prices going up and not being passed on um, to, to buyers. So I think that is reflective to some extent of a lot of competition in the market and a sense that um, in order to remain competitive, you've got to keep prices low. And that means margins have to absorb a lot of these higher costs. And then that puts businesses on the back foot when it comes to hiring more aggressively or looking at investing or expanding their businesses because they just are that much more focused on reducing costs and protecting their margins. You also mentioned a, a big disparity in different segments of the housing market. And obviously, uh, you know, particularly in Dubai, where, where you have a local population that lives in a certain area of town and expats that largely live in the freehold areas. Uh, it, it's hard to talk about the aggregate stock of housing, I suppose. But could you give us some idea of where you see the, the supply of housing stock relative to demand in Dubai? And if there are any segments that might be uh, oversupplied or undersupplied? So I think if we look at the stock overall, um, certainly the last time I looked at the data, it was very clear that the majority of the housing stock in Dubai is apartments, um, probably around 75 to 80% uh, of the total housing stock is apartments. And so already you can see why during the pandemic, when there was a shift from people wanting more, sp you know, more space to work from home, um, and school from home and they wanted their own outside space, there was a huge shift in demand from apartments to villas of which there are, there are fewer. Um, and that was one of the main reasons why we saw such a big increase in the cost of uh, villas relative to apartments and in particular larger independent villas relative to, to smaller townhouses. Um, now, you know, there is um, a lot of stock 
coming through in the pipeline. They've, there are a number of new projects that have been launched. Um, and quite a lot of them are more townhouse type projects rather than uh, traditional apartments. Um, so that may look to boost the supply in that segment of the market, which does seem to be more in demand. Um, but I think overall, um, you know, going forward, looking at, at housing, do we think the, the price growth that we've seen in um, certain free zone segments of the market can be sustained? Probably not. We do have um, a sharp increase in borrowing costs, which will come through in the second half of the year, which will probably cool demand. Um, and then again, as you have this new supply coming online as well, that should help to meet some of the uh, some of the demand in parts of the market that have perhaps historically been uh, in short supply. So I think overall, um, we should see the housing market in Dubai cool um, in, in the coming months and over the next year or so. Um, I would expect to see a much more moderate rate of price growth. And looking at the supply and the construction sector, uh, the PMI data from Dubai uh, for the last couple of months show activity in construction and real estate is uh, slowing and that output prices are slumping. So is this moderation in house prices that you were talking about that you expect? Is this feeding into the underlying construction industry at this point? Um, I think that it, it may be. I mean, they, we have seen a lot of new projects being announced on the residential side. I think more broadly on the construction sector, um, we obviously had a lot of activity in the run up to Expo because there was all of the infrastructure that had to be put in place um, and not just sort of the roads and the metro, but um, the, the leisure attractions, the actual Expo infrastructure and then um, housing and um, office space around it as well. And of course, uh, hotels uh, and hospitality. So um, I think, you know, over the last 10 years, let's say, um, there's been quite a lot of, of uh, need for construction uh, work going forward. With now that the expo has been delivered, that demand is, is not going to be there. Um, and also, I think the construction sector has probably been one of those which has been more affected by the increase in input costs that we've seen over the last year or so. So when you look at the raw materials that go into um, a building something, those are the, the commodities that have seen quite a significant increase in price. Now, as firms try and pass on those higher costs, it's entirely possible that people are simply saying, well, we're not prepared to pay those higher costs for this project, and so we'll just wait. Um, you know, perhaps delay it um, or, or downsize it um, or, or just um, rethink whether they want to go ahead with certain projects or not, uh, given the, the higher costs that are now being faced. Um, so I think, you know, we'll have to wait and see how, how things evolve. But I do think that overall, um, given the amount of investment in building that's happened um, over the last decade uh, in Dubai, um, I don't know that that's going to be replicated over the next 10 years. And then, um, you know, to the extent that we see some moderation in input costs or input, um, uh, you know, products, um, whether that can then uh, support uh, new projects being launched, um, if the price is right, you know, we'll have to wait and see. I've always been amazed uh, in Dubai, it seems like when one sector is on the back foot, there, there's something else to kind of take over and make up the slack uh, in terms of a rebalancing. And so if construction is going to be a bit slower over the next uh, few years compared to the last decade, uh, what sectors in Dubai do you think will make up the slack and lead growth? Yeah, it's a question I get asked a lot. Um, I think if we look at the, the structural reforms that have been put in place in, in the broader UAE over the last couple of years, They've really made tremendous strides in, um, first of all, opening the economy uh, in terms of um, allowing people to move to Dubai, perhaps without having a job, um, starting up their own businesses, um, bringing investment to Dubai, um, staying for longer. So even if you, you come in um, you know, on, a, on a work permit for a specific company, um, you're now able to uh, you know, get a visa that allows you to stay regardless of whether you're working or not. So I think a lot of... Um, the the changes in those types of uh, regulations is attracting a different kind of worker to Dubai. There seems to be, and this is just all anecdotal, really, uh, an increase in the number of people who are working for 
companies in other parts of the world, like Europe, um, you know, or Asia, or even uh, to some extent North America, were choosing to base themselves in Dubai for lifestyle reasons because the pandemic was really well managed here and things have largely gone back to normal. Um, and so, you know, they've brought uh, with them different different skill sets, um, and that's helped to boost demand. And I think, um, you know, I, that sort of trend in terms of attracting different kinds of people to Dubai, I think, will support population growth going forward. Um, and then in addition to that, there have been a number of um, rules that have been changed and relaxed to try and bring in um, foreign direct investment and to try and encourage private investment. So things like the uh, ability to now own a company onshore without the need for a local sponsor, you know, 100% foreign ownership rules, um, easing the, the process with which uh, somebody can start a business in Dubai. It, it's, it's a lot cheaper now to do so, um, and it's a lot easier. There are new uh, licenses for online businesses and tech businesses. There's a new push to try and um, attract um, you know, crypto businesses uh, into, into the UAE. And just generally growing that technology space and, um, you know, the, the fintech space. Um, and I think that there has been quite a lot of traction in that area. So um, I think those are sort of the new emerging industries that are likely to become more important. Um, and then there's also just a big push to grow the manufacturing base of the UAE. And we've seen that it's been an explicit target by the government that they want to triple the size of the manufacturing sector over the next decade. Um, and again, a lot of measures being brought in to attract foreign firms to base themselves here um, and to bring the, the technology and the skills with them. So I think um, all of those structural reforms will contribute to existing sector growth, perhaps in a different way. Um, and then also new sectors emerging. Um, and a, a, you know a more value-added type of economy um, being being created. We'll have to leave it there. But Khatija, thank you very much for a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much for having me.